Right, so um, good morning. I think it's still morning time. And thank you, Marta, for inviting me uh, to talk in this session. Uh, my paper today is going to be about Atlantic rock art, which is a prehistoric carving tradition that um, we can find today in, a several, in several um, European countries of the Atlantic facade. So um, in Scotland and England, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, maybe in France, some people say in Scandinavia, but um, around this area. Uh, oh, there it is. So in terms of iconography, Atlantic rock art style is largely based on geometric and abstract motifs. Um, the circular, the cup and, cup and ring marks are certainly the most famous ones with cup marks as well. Uh, they're penannular rings, wavy grooves, um, and these are usually combined in um, several types of compositions. <coughs> in Iberia, we have also animals and weapons which are so far um, absent in the, other, in the other regions. So these motifs are usually carved on open air uh, boulders and outcrops, and traditionally uh, researchers tend to, to, to consider them as preferentially located in mid slopes where they can, um, in, or in upland areas, areas where, can, where they can command extensive views. So in terms of chronology, uh, these have traditionally been ascribed to the Bronze Age, but lately uh, there's been a number of, of authors suggesting that they are actually a little bit older, so going back to the Neolithic, and this is based on uh, re-evaluations of, of sites where, where these finds are, um, are made, new finds of, of carvings, and also archaeological excavations that have been happening more and more often um, around the, the rocks. So um, this talk today is a small part of a, of a larger project uh, which was aiming to investigate the nature of Atlantic art, the social and cultural context, uh, but also potential connections between the areas uh, where this type of rock art is found. So um, I was also interested in questioning the unified character of Atlantic art since in terms of the shapes, uh, the carving techniques, the locations where the engravings are found, there's a great sense of familiarity um, between all these, these regions that I mentioned previously. And so Atlantic art seems to represent tangible evidence of prehistoric interactions between the British Isles and the continent which I was interested in exploring. However, when visiting um, the rock art in situ, there is a very obvious sense of difference between all these um, all these regions, a and this is very hard to, to explain why, because they're so similar, but at the same time, they're all so different. And so, in order to understand these differences, I needed to, um, well, find a way to compare these, um, these regions. Uh, and so I defined five study areas, one in each uh, of the countries, following um, a selection of, uh, well, criteria, selection criteria that would be applied to all these, uh, these regions equally. So I have um, um, a study area in Scotland in the Maccas. I have uh, I've studied Rombos more in England, Ivory Peninsula in, in Ireland, Barbanza Peninsula in Spain, so in the uh, Galician province, and Montfaro in North Portugal. I also created a robust platform for comparison, or I'd like to think that it is a robust platform for comparison, which is based on a multi-scalar methodology which ignored the uh, uh, modern administrative borders and relied on empirical data sets. So this um, methodology combined uh, principles of relational ontology and assemblage theory and then printed a very dynamic relational character to the study producing a concept of Atlantic art built on a network of dynamic relationships established between the various um, components that I studied so the motifs, the rock media, locations, terrain, um, so the affordances of the terrain and the carved rocks, execution techniques and, and others. Um, so the methodology was then designed to look at a graphic scale, which refers to the, the motifs and uh, the very small details of their morphology and their making. A sensory scale focused on the rock medium and the way that these motifs actually interact with it. Um, a local scale, which is the immediate surroundings of, of the carved rocks. And what I call the environmental scale, which has to do with uh, the wider landscape. So in this talk, um, I will focus on the larger scale of analysis. I think I'm missing a, scale, um, a slide, actually. 
Yeah. Okay. So I was supposed to have deleted this. So basically, these are all my uh, my uh, my categories that then I kind of related um, in a dynamic way uh, with the use of uh, of um, network science, which I'm not going to be talking about today because I will be focusing on my environmental scale. Um, so this was divided, as I said, in two levels. So the immediate environs of the carved rocks and the wider landscape. And the landscape, landscape studies have been an integral and important part of rock art studies since particularly Bradley's work in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, and although mostly most of the studies were conducted through sensorial approaches, some of Bradley's observations were actually tested with GIS by uh, Gaffney in 1995, and these were related with his uh, visibility and viewshed analysis. So the main landscape studies, um, as I said, were, were directed mostly to uh, the visibility affordances of the rock art, the relationship to landmarks and natural features, namely watercourses, um, as well as routes of movement and pathways. Um, in the last decades, GIS and other computational technologies have been essential in approaches to rock art, um, as this technology enables a number of, of quick analysis that can be replicated uh, and quantifiable, and so it gives us a more kind of um, a different grasp on the information that we can retrieve from the field. The field. Um, so to study Atlantic rock art, I undertook a number of GIS analyses in each of my study areas, addressing features that had been previously considered meaningful for rock art location and spatial distribution, such as visibility and orientation. I also assessed the relationship to slopes, intervisibility, visibility towards the carved rocks, clustering patterns and relationships with other types of archaeological sites. So today what I'll be um, focusing on is the visibility patterns, uh, which have been a proxy for landscape perception and a recurrent theme in rock art uh, studies, as I just mentioned. So um, evidence suggests that visibility, or the lack of visibility, may have been determined in the location of archaeological sites and activities. Several authors have claimed that wide vistas are, important, are an important factor in the location of rock art, or that these are located in important landscape viewpoints, sometimes with preferential orientations towards natural units or built monuments. Nevertheless, we should analyze visibility critically, since we have been transposing into the past, or we may have been transposing into the past, our concepts of contemporary Western cultures imbued with this emphasis on the visual which may have not been that relevant in the past. So although I was interested in carrying out GIS analysis to my data set, I was also um, wanting to contrast the results with field observations. The models created for this study were of course not flawless, especially because the base maps represent the current land uh, or terrain, and this may have changed due to human and natural events throughout time. Vegetation was not directly considered due to a lack of environmental studies and atmospheric conditions are very difficult to include in computational models. Or at least I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, in addition, the human eye has a limited acuity of vision and loses precision at a certain range, meaning that the longer the distance, the less detail is apprehended. As such, I ran spatial analysis prior to fieldwork. I made field observations on, on the same characteristics that I analyzed. And then I reprocessed the GIS analysis based on the data that I gathered in the field in an attempt to overcome the computational limitations, introducing a more human perspective to my conclusions. So this approach was not designed to meet the complex requirements of embodied space, but the combination of data sources resulted in an exercise of embodied GIS, using um, Street Eve's um, expression, which is an, an engagement of human scales of landscape um, with places and social, cultural, and experiential phenomena. So the results of the GIS analysis and field observations did not always uh, match, and in some cases the differences were quite striking. So confirming the conclusions of some authors, the visibility analysis suggested that the carved rocks are actually visually related to specific elements in the landscape, such as valleys, mountains, or the coast, although this can also have to do with you know, their, their, their location, their distribution. Um, so for instance, in the case of, in the case of, of the Macos, for instance, most of the rocks that we know, the carved rocks that we know are located in the coast. So obviously my, uh, okay, that's not good. <laughs> so obviously my results were actually 
pointing out as, as, with, as a, to a strong connection uh, with the coast. Um, so these results can actually bring misconceptions. For example, the GIS analysis of the macros, this is just what I, what I, what I was uh, about to say, um, revealed that visibility from the rocks located on the side, on one side of the, of the peninsula could actually reach the opposite side of the peninsula, which is like 12 kilometers away. Um, and in the field, obviously, this was very different because although I could potentially see the area where the other rocks are, I couldn't possibly see the points or the rocks themselves. So that's into visibility one. The vegetation also uh, has, you know, a large influence in the way we, we uh, visualize the rock art because it evolves and transforms throughout the year. And there's a great number of rocks that could have effectively been covered during specific periods, either by soil, turf, or very dense uh, plant growth. This means that in many cases, despite the short distances, the decorated surfaces are not always intervisible, contrasting with a lot of the GIS results that I had. Other elements, such as knolls, hillocks, watercourses, may also in, um, interrupt our intervisibilities. Uh, intervisibilities. In addition, it is possible that the carvings themselves were not very visible against the rock media. Um, a few experiences of modern engraving suggest that a natural patina would form relatively quickly, uh, disguising the motifs against the, their natural background. This means that the quick natural weathering process of the carvings would make them invisible in the landscape as well. So these results suggest that, unlike um, previous, previously thought, perhaps Atlantic art was not supposed to be visible in the landscape, but instead secluded, and that this seclusion would happen due to a variety of factors. The idea is corroborated by uh, rare finds of carvings and shelters, which occurred recently in, in, in Galicia. And the fieldwork that we did uh, supported <coughs> this idea, suggesting that despite its open air context and the majority of the cases, um, so despite the fact that they're in open air context, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were supposed to be found and they were supposed to be seen. Um, many carvings are in fact deployed on small low-lying flat rocks not very prominent in the landscape and people would either encounter them by chance or know where they are um, in, in advance so that they can look for them, um, for them deliberately. So um, in terms of... Sorry, my slides are and my notes are not matching, so this is being <laughs> a little bit complicated. Uh, anyway, so although not immediately apparent, uh, the GIS studies also suggested that the carved rocks could be visually controlling specific areas through an intricate network of visibility. And this is a little bit speculative, but the fact is that, sorry, um, when I kind of added all the simple view sheds, I have an incredible coverage of visibility in the main areas where these rocks are. And this happened in every, in all of my regions. Of course, this could do with, this could be, um, has to, could have to do, gosh, could be uh, due to the, uh, to the density of, of the rock arts, the distribution, but um, yeah, something to, to study in the future, I suppose. And then it's going back, but well, we're not going back. So, finally, uh, visibility towards the rocks from their surroundings was also assessed during the fieldwork and uh, through uh, the GIS analysis. And in order to minimize computer bias, the rocks were evaluated according to specific distances following Higuchi's principle. So this parameter investigated uh, which characteristics or elements of the carved rocks could be seen from 10 meters, where uh, you, you can still see uh, motifs, 30 meters, where you can distinguish the rocks, 100 meters, um, where the rocks start being confused with other features, but perhaps you can still identify some of them, and 500 meters um, where you can perhaps see a point on the landscape, but you won't necessarily identify the rock itself. So general research uh, results show that in the majority of the study areas, the rocks are not immediately visible in the surrounding um, environs, even when at distances of 50 meters. And in fact, uh, they, they are seemingly more visible from locations further away, which unsurprisingly correspond to higher grounds than those where they're placed. So in most study areas, results uh, reveal that the carved rocks are not highly visually 
uh, perceptible in the landscape at any of the defined distances, which is more or less what we found in the field as well. Because most of them are just, just can't find them unless they're great big boulders. So instead of transversal visibility patterns, the study concluded that uh, there are noticeable differences between the visibility patterns of the, of the study areas um, and that the locations of the rocks are seemingly related to immediate needs rather than a pre-existing rule. So instead of patterns, we have preferences. Visibility may have been an important factor in the selection of the media to carve, but it could have also been a product of chance um, with other factors being more important in the rock art location. So whether there is something carved there already, whether there is, you know, th there's a lot in, in oral traditions that we don't know about that could be more important in the location of the rock art than the natural features, which is the only thing that we can assess these days anyway. Um, so even rocks that are situated in viewpoints or those that command extensive views would have been conditioned, for instance, by climatic circumstances, um, which are important obstacles to visibility. So constant mist and rain dramatically reduce our visibility over the rocks and the landscape in general. And, uh, and I suppose that the point that I really want to make is that GIS is really is really good to give us an idea of what the terrain can what we can do in the terrain and the affordances of the terrain, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with humans and their behavior is quite unpredictable. So I think that we always have to contrast both uh, the modeling and also the um, the body the embodied experience. So that that's it really. Thank you very much.